So welcome to tonight's event, uh, part of the Beverage 2.0 Festival. And I think our speaker tonight could well be described as very, being very much in the tradition of beverage, uh, insofar as what she has to propose is a very radical overhauling of the structures of the ways in which we meet people's needs, exactly, of course, what beverage did uh, all those years ago. Um, but I think it's also a very clear departure from the sorts of uh, welfare state that Beveridge set in train. Um, we're not looking tonight at mass institutions, we're looking at bottom-up solutions. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr Hilary Cotton tonight. Uh, she combines thoughtful analysis of our serious social problems with practical action and demonstration projects to show how change can happen. I think that's a particularly rare and very welcome uh, combination. She has uh, a PhD and uh, degrees in geography, history and development economics, so she's very much in the tradition also of LSE um, in the broad social science um, education. And she's worked in Africa and Latin America for organisations including the World Bank and Care International. And in 2006, she founded the organisation Participle to demonstrate and explore, experiment with different ways of working in order to meet uh, people's needs. She's here today to talk to us about her book, Radical Help, um, which um, she herself has seen in hard copy for the very first time this evening, so it really is um, almost literally hot off the press. Um, and you will have seen as you come in, the book is available um, at a stall uh, outside if you'd like to purchase a copy. I've had the privilege of reading a pre-publication copy, and I can tell you you are in for a treat uh, when you get your own, uh, your own copy. Hilary's going to talk for about half an hour, um, I'll offer some brief remarks in response, and we may have a bit of a, a conversation between us, and I'll then open up to the floor for your questions and, and contributions. Um, but over to you. Thank Hillary. you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's really, I mean, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, because starting with the wonderful inaugural lecture that uh, Dame Manoush Shafiq gave here, many great minds have already got together, I've watched a lot of the lectures on film, um, to celebrate Beveridge and to think about his legacy. So it's, it's a great privilege for me to be here. And um, as Tanya said, although I like to kind of keep close to the rigours of academia, I, I'm not an academic, I'm actually an activist and a social entrepreneur. And uh, over the decades, I have worked with communities in Africa, Latin America, and more recently here in Britain. And as many of you who have also been on that journey, you all know that it's quite a kind of winding road. And I started out young and idealistic. I'm still idealistic. I'm, I'm not that young, but I am still idealistic. And I worked, as Tanya said, with governments and international NGOs, with UNICEF, the World Bank. And I watched quite disheartened, actually, as time and again, despite the kind of brilliance of many of my colleagues, their deep expertise and their great intentions, the politics and the structures of the institutions we work within seem to somehow transform what they were trying to create. And I saw how things that looked like really good ideas, policy documents that read brilliantly and sound very sensible, somehow become something quite different when they hit the ground and they kind of connect with people's lives. So I had this growing conviction that something was missing and I'd studied history and economics and I felt somehow that I needed to learn again and live the realities of others and share their ideas and knowledge and begin to kind of work in a different way. So in the mid-90s, I moved to a barrio in the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, a place where about 40,000 people live in a network of open sewers. And that was the start for me of a really very different way of working in a different practice that I'm continuing to develop. And it's one that starts with people rooted in everyday lives, but also retains a commitment to system change. I'm very interested in how we do actually transform systems. So in the last decade, I've been working in Britain, and I've continued to work in this way. And I've got to know all sorts of people, people like Stan, who's in the book. And uh, Stan is a gentleman in his 90s. He served in the war. He's an amazing backgammon player. He's a big Arsenal fan. And he lives uh, in the heart of London. He doesn't live very far from here, actually. He lives close to shops, theatres, cafes, and yet he's completely alone. 
He's lucky if he speaks to somebody once a week. And so he's like uh, over two million other people in this country today who only do speak to somebody once a week. And when we asked Stan what would make the biggest difference to his life, what he said was that he would like to hear a little of the music that he really loves, Sinatra, big band, the music of his youth, with other people who genuinely also like that music. And I got to know people like Ella. Ella lives on a tough and run-down estate, and like many of the mothers I work with, she has two mobile phones. So one number she gives to a very small, tight group of friends and family, and the other number she uses to manage what she calls the social. So she's trying to keep the welfare state at bay. She and her family suffer from a really very wide and complex set of problems. Debt, violence, lack of work. Her children have been excluded from school and have already been in and out of care. And one of the reasons that Ella has this other phone is because she's terrified that her son is going to be taken into care again. Everybody who lives around her on the estate has had that experience or knows someone who's had a child taken away. Um, and I also spend time with the amazing people who work in our welfare states. Uh, welfare systems, I should say, teachers, nurses, doctors, social workers, carers. These are professionals who are utterly committed to what they do, but very often deeply exhausted from trying to kind of provide good care and take care of people within systems whose rules and boundaries and conditions just aren't set up for the problems we face today. So this is the problem that I want to talk about this evening. But I think the architecture within which we're working, the architecture set up by Beveridge, <coughs> and our once very brilliant institutions are no longer fit for purpose. They can't create change for Ella or for Stan, and they can't provide the conditions necessary for the professionals who work in the system. So I wrote Radical Help because I wanted to think about what we can do about these institutions that aren't any longer fit for purpose. And the funny thing is that as part of this process, what I've learned is that Beveridge himself, in fact, knew there was a problem. And 70 years ago, he actually also wrote about the fatal flaw in his systems. So the Beveridge story uh, starts somewhere else. I was going to bring my report, but I think we've got a copy of it. I mean, I think all of you know about this, this famous classic report, the one we call the Beveridge Report, with its actual ungainly title of Social Insurance and Allied Services. And uh, so this report, published in 1942, is the stuff of legend. Probably everybody who's come here as part of this series has talked about it about how there was a rumour that it was so radical that in fact it would be stopped by the civil service. So that's why people camped out on the streets to try and get hold of a copy. They'd heard about it, they wanted to make sure they could actually see it, um, and that it didn't disappear. It sold out in weeks, it was continually reprinted. In fact, my copy was printed in the 1960s and was translated into 22 languages. So this was the blueprint for the welfare state, and I absolutely love it because I think what it shows us is what's possible. So Beveridge, in the opening pages, he very grandly says, this is not a time for patching and mending, this is a time for revolutions, which, you know, coming sort of out of um, a time of war and, uh, and deep recession of the 1930s was very, very brave. And as we know, this report unleashed this program of action of building, reorganizing, homes, hospitals, family services, education for all. And it did transform, in a few decades, a country that in many ways looked quite Dickensian into what we kind of now see as the sort of hip swinging 60s. And then Beveridge followed up um, on this first report with a second, more technical document, which was probably in the exhibition, I don't know. Um, and here, actually, this was a report on employment, and here, actually, the civil servants were able to get ahead of Beveridge. They sidelined his report, which was about a different thinking on full employment and the industrial transitions Britain was making, and they published their own report to try and kind of sideline what he was saying. And then he wrote a third report on voluntary action. And uh, the path of this report didn't run smoothly. Jose Harris, who is uh, the biographer of Beveridge gives a brilliant account of, of what happened, which I really recommend to everybody. So this third report on voluntary action was bedeviled by infighting from the voluntary sector, who Beveridge found, much to his amazement, were much more interested in fighting each other and squabbling over who had what than actually trying to kind of move systems on and think about what could be new for the 20th century. And so the result was this, publish, this report published in 1946, which was very unfocused and lacking in clear recommendations. And the world had moved on. Beveridge's language sounded quite fusty. Of course, everybody was already enjoying the welfare state, so they were no longer quite so interested in social policy reports. And this third report on voluntary action was not read by many people and quite quickly forgotten. But it's the report that interests me, because in it, Beveridge writes about this fatal flaw in his thinking. When the welfare state was created, Beveridge, the Webbs, and the wider circle here at the LSE 
were convinced of the transformative power of the state and the cool impartiality of bureaucrats. So famously, the Webbs wrote about how they disparaged what they called the average sensual man, and they kind of you know, extolled the virtues of this detached professional who would work within rule-bound institutions and be very equal. And, and, and there were merits to this system. But as the imp implementation progressed, Beveridge started to worry that he'd left out people, relationships, and the communities, and he began to believe that his reforms were blunted. And Beveridge highlighted two problems. Firstly, he said, needs are changing all the time, and they manifest themselves in ways which are actually very difficult to see or understand if you're in a kind of institution. They're much easier to understand at the community level. And he also thought that the categories that the state had to work with in these rule-bound ways were very blunting and limiting, and that people were forced to see themselves in these categories in order to get help, and then began to internalize these categories and begin to see themselves as somehow lacking in something and lacking in agency. So by 1946, actually, Beveridge was quite disillusioned with his own reforms. In Radical Help, I argue that Beveridge did change the course of history, and I think we need to tell and retell the story of the founding of the welfare state because it is so inspiring that there was the courage to grow this out of the ruins of war, and that this innovation project, which is probably the biggest innovation project the world has ever seen, started here and our lives were transformed. But I also argue that these institutions have run out of steam. They're unsuited to the challenges of the modern world. And of course, most people realize that the welfare state is in trouble. But the problem is, what should we do about it? Today, we've got the Prime Minister on, in the headlines with the Chancellor and the Health Secretary debating about how much should be invested in our health service. And we hear that the Prime Minister also wants to reopen debates again about how to reorganize that same health service. And actually, I mean, this is not a party political point because the leader of the opposition has made it just as clear that if he gets into power, what he's going to do is invest billions in these post-war institutions. But let me tell you about Anne. Anne is someone I work with. And she lives a life that's totally defined by her illness. She's in pain, she's overweight, and she has nine specialists who manage her different conditions. So in fact, she lives a life that is about being unwell. It's a full-time job to kind of make it to all those specialist appointments, particularly because it's hard for her to move around. But when I meet the doctors who are surrounding Anne, they tell me something that Anne actually herself already knows, which is that the drugs don't work. So Anne is dependent on the NHS, but she actually needs something completely different a form of support that would enable her and her family to take the steps at home and, if possible, later at work, that would manage her pain and restore her to live a life despite her chronic conditions. And she represents, she and thousands of people like her, the biggest challenge that faces our NHS and our health systems globally, which is how to shift these systems that were designed to fight against infectious disease to ones that can actually cope with the challenge of living today with chronic disease. No amount of reorganization is going to help. One in four of us have a chronic condition. These are the ailments like diabetes, depression, complications of old age. And our health service is straining under the challenge. 70% of hospital expenditure today is absorbed by people with chronic conditions, but not one of these people can be cured. Of course, we need a completely different approach. The problems of this century, like chronic disease, the loneliness of Stan's life, aging, immigration, climate change, they weren't foreseen. They're the big challenges facing us, and Beveridge couldn't foresee them. But what I think is really important is not just, or not even so much, that these problems are new, but they're utterly different in nature. We have to solve them in different ways. So loneliness, like chronic illness, is a problem that can't be solved by a traditional service. We can't deliver something to Stan like a package, because like most of the older people we work with, he doesn't want to be befriended by somebody who feels they're doing good. He wants to be with people who genuinely like him and he genuinely likes. And our welfare institutions, well, I mean, yeah, so this is the thing, that this is, you know, whether it's Stan or whether it's um, Anne with her health problems, um, all the solutions that we need today come from this web of activity with peers, with friends, with relations, with families, basically horizontal bonds between us. But our welfare institutions are designed very vertically. They reflect, of course, the industrial era in which they were born and designed, their command and control. And they're designed also to keep us at arm's length in that very neutral way that the Webbs talked about, whilst they fix us in their sort of industrial repair shops and manage the queue. So that's the first problem we face, that we have new problems that demand new approaches. The second major challenge, I think, is that the social and economic structures on which the welfare state was based no longer exist. So Beveridge built his welfare state on unpaid women's labor. The tidy housewife at home who was going to you know, take care of her husband, her children, 
the neighbours, get the supper ready and then care for older relatives. She isn't there anymore. And, you know, that, that sort of arrangement started to fracture in the 60s, but we've never really found a, a resolution for it. We don't know how to care for our very young children. We don't know how to care for our ageing parents. And actually, we don't even have the language in which to describe it. If we read reports from government or from the third sector, they talk about units and how to, how to manage units. So the change in the economic structures is equally profound. We're relying on a set of institutions that were designed to support an industrial economy, and of course we have this massive and very tra fast transition now around the possibilities of the digital, hyperconnectivity, artificial intelligence, biotech, and so on. And the third reason, I think, that our welfare state can't work is poverty, because poverty hasn't gone away as Beveridge expected. In fact, it's deepening, and I think it's becoming more complex as well. So in 2016, the Roundtree Foundation, who had been collecting poverty data for over 100 years, Beveridge was friends, of course, with Roundtree, had to add a new category to their research. And for the last two years, they've been collecting in this category that they call destitution. So in this country, there are 1.25 million children and 300,000 children that don't have anything to eat, they don't keep warm, they don't have a home, and they often don't have a bed for the night. So it might feel like we've gone a full circle, but again, there's something very different, which is that most poverty today is in-work <coughs> poverty. Most people, who have, uh, most people who are poor are in work, and nearly half of all British families are supported by benefits as the welfare state is forced to subsidise the private sector and top up wages that aren't high enough to live on. So you probably all know, but when I talk to other people, my friends, they're often quite surprised that only 1% of the welfare budget goes on the unemployed. That's predicted to be about 2.3 billion expenditure this year. 70 billion goes on in-work benefits. But nobody wants to live on these handouts. They want good work that's decently paid. So as the inequalities between us grow, driven in part by these same changes in the economy, these yawning gaps have opened up between us. We don't live close to each other, we don't often go to the same schools together, and we certainly don't join the same things together anymore. And the work of uh, Professor Savage here at the LSE, which I'm sure a lot of you know, has shown just how much this matters. So we need a strong network of relationships to thrive, to find a job, to progress in work, to stay well, to be cared for, all these things depend on money, but they also depend on our relationships. So just when meeting the modern challenges requires this very strong network of horizontal bonds, we find that we don't really know each other anymore, and we've got this big rent in our social fabric. So I think that Beveridge's third report was very prescient, and that this lack of relationships matters more than ever, and I think it can be the starting point for our own revolution. So in Radical Health, um, now, how can I do this? Let's see. No. No, there's no clicker. Ha! Huh. So um, I argue that we uh, need to make these six big shifts or transformations. One has sort of, the, the vision one has sort of floated off into the kind of vision level. Um, but I'm not going to talk about them all. But I think what is important is that the Beveridge Welfare State, when you read, uh, you know, Beveridge's documents and you read what he wrote, he wasn't really interested in services. He was interested in how to provide the framework for a really thriving 20th century democracy. And of course, you need services. You need people who are healthy, educated, so that they can participate. But it wasn't really about the services. And today, our focus has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed, and we've become fixated on service delivery. In fact, the you know, welfare state really has collapsed into a discussion about public services. Um, and so what passes for welfare reform is really just an attempt to kind of find efficiencies in those services and, you know, break this broken model, usually through privatisation. And uh, this is rather than kind of, of course, inventing anything new. And the effect has been, I think, to drive out further the relationships between us as this transactional model, this market model, has intensified. So if you want to see the same doctor, you're told it's too expensive. If you want to extend a hand to a troubled teenager, that's too risky. You want to ask the community how they could solve something? Well, it sounds nice, but then you find out it's against the rules of competition. So all of these shifts matter. But, um, and together, they have to be taken together, I think, and they're the framework for a 21st century social settlement. But the second shift, for me, goes to the heart of the matter, and it's the one I want to discuss with you here this evening, which is this shift from a welfare state that manages needs to the potential of one that could grow all our capabilities. So I want to invert this. I want to turn it upside down. And in the ethnographic work I do, I sit alongside services and I track the way that resource moves through our institutions. And it's astonishing that from prisons to healthcare to modern social work, 
I've absorbed the way that 80% of the resource is basically in the current system, absorbed by the system itself. It's as if the system is eating itself. So the money and the professional time goes on gatekeeping, assessing, referring, managing the queue. Nothing goes on actually fostering change. And this is what I call a management state, because the money isn't making change. And arguably, actually, it's worse than that. It's actually depleting our own resources because we come to feel dependent on it. And so that's why I think we need to turn things on their head. And in the book, I set out how this new system could work cradle to grave and how we could make the transition. And I can only touch on that this evening, but I want to give a couple of examples. So to go back to Stan, of course, as I've said, ageing wasn't a challenge when the welfare state was invented. I mean, Beveridge expected us to live eight years beyond retirement, which I think would make the oldest person 73 or something. But obviously, everybody is living at least 20 years beyond retirement. And although we celebrate birthdays and rising life expectancy, we do fear the process of ageing. And I think it's a fear stoked in no small part by this continual debate we have around us about what's going to happen to us, that there's just not going to be enough to go around. And one in ten care positions in Britain is vacant. And I think that's because so few, well, in fact, I know, so few can bear to work for pe in you know, such terrible conditions for such low pay where the euphemism of personal care means that you'll actually never see the same person twice, so they leave a note by the door reminding the next person that the pink flannel's for your face and the blue flannel's for your bottom. And this is just demeaning. It's utterly demeaning for people who have to do that work, and it's utterly demeaning for us who need the care. So I think it's definitely true that the arrangements can't cope. But it's also true that 80% of the uh, wealth in Britain today is in the hands of people over 60. We all know about the bank of mum and dad. So this resource isn't fairly distributed, which in the work we do, because we want to include everybody, we want new universal services, we have to think about. But I think we need to start there, where the resource is, um, is, is greatest. <coughs> so about 10 years ago, with the team I work with, including somebody here in this room who is also in the book, we asked the question, what could happen if we uh, started with older people themselves? And we went to the estates of Peckham, where I live, and we played bingo, we had Sunday lunch, we looked in people's fridges, we were quite nosy, we drank a lot of tea. We basically wanted to understand how people were living. People assume, first of all, that I've got power, and they say, oh, that the meals on wheels aren't working, or could we change the times of swimming or something at the library? But then people eventually realise that, of course, I haven't got any power at all, and I'm just actually interested in how things work. And we learned that a flourishing old age requires three things, practical help, good company, and a sense of purpose. So we set about making it happen. We rented a couple of phone lines, we started to put together a social calendar, things to do, places to meet. Um, Daniel here bought a drill and gardening tools and started to kind of provide on-demand support for a small fee. People paid about £30 to join. And we called this experiment Circle, and it grew quite quickly at first, first of all in London, and then we seeded the idea in different parts of the country, and some did well and others didn't work and, and didn't take off. But about 10,000 people took part. And three things made this approach possible. So firstly, we built on the resource that exists. We want to help and take care of each other, but the current institutions don't allow it. So what happens, for instance, if you're supporting an older person, you have to struggle until you've got almost nothing left, and then they can move into a state institution, at which point you know it's visiting hours only and complaints in the box by the door. There's no kind of interconnection between the systems. The, um, and so that makes us feel that we can't take part or we don't want to take part because the systems just aren't designed for it. The second factor is technology. So in the 1950s, if you wanted your light bulb change, you did have to write a letter and wait in a queue and so on. But it doesn't need to be that way now. So we use very, we never have much resource, so we use very simple available things, technology, um, CRM systems, the customer relationship management systems that all businesses use to provide an on-demand service. So if you need somebody to take you to hospital or pick you up, you can call us and we know who can do that. If you need somebody to take care of your pets, somebody who's having a coffee morning, whatever it is, we can provide it in real time. And this technology totally upends the business model of care and of ageing services, where resource is all about the minibus, the building, things that we don't actually need because we can connect things <coughs> together, we have flow in new ways. And the third factor that made change was our emphasis on capability. It was about saying, what would you like to do? How could we help you to do it? And what we found was that people, for instance, we often used to show this picture of this lovely old lady called Florence who used to walk around the park near us in a pink cardi, that people who tell you in the beginning they're housebound, Florence told us she was housebound, gradually can be encouraged to come back out. Because Florence wasn't housebound, she wasn't pretending, but in order to get help, her social worker had given her the label of being housebound, and gradually over time she'd come to believe it, she'd gone out less and less, and felt less and less uh, able. But with kind of strong support, caring relationships in place, she was able to kind of get back on her feet and get out and about again. 
So Circle saved money for local authorities who participated, money they could you know, reinvest in expensive end-of-life care. It took pressure off services. In one location, uh, visits to the GP fell by 25% because people didn't really need anybody to talk to anymore. They had friends to talk to. And in the book, I show how this same capability approach can transform the lives of young people, how it can help us find and progress in good work, how it can change our health and support good age. <coughs> but what about those who are really suffering, you might ask? Those locked out of society, those that social policy call the hardest to reach. <coughs> those like Ella, because as I say, when I met Ella, she'd never worked. She'd lived this life of crisis, ricocheting from one thing to another. And 73 professionals working out of 24 departments had been involved in her and her family's life. Each person genuinely trying to do good, tripping over the other person, but really not making any change. And the leaders of the city where Ella lives knew that families like hers were falling through the gaps, that reorganizations and new services and more money in those services wasn't asking. So they asked, could the capability approach work even in this very tough circumstance? And we didn't know, but we wanted to find out. So we rented a house on the estate where Ella lives, and members of the team I work with at Participle moved in. And we were there on the sofa when the police came, social workers came to call, the loan shark and so on. We were out looking for wayward teenagers after dark, going for the ready meal on the you know, reduced cost cutter shelf at the end of the day, just living lives and, and um, participating. And we also spent time with frontline workers, with Ryan, for example, who is the social worker for Ella's 14-year-old son, Tom. And we looked at how Ryan had to spend his time. 74% of Ryan's time is spent on administration, and a further 12% is spent on meetings, talking to colleagues. He was trying to find um, a, a space for Tom in a, a home for troubled boys so that he could remove Tom from the family. That leaves 14% of Ryan's time to work with his clients, one-to-one -one interactions with this huge caseload that he has. And it's watching the interaction between Tom and Ryan that I realized quite how deep the change needs to be. Because Ryan, the social worker, is very committed. He's very good with young people. But when he meets Tom, he needs information for the forms. So what follows isn't a conversation. It's a sort of tetchy interview. And Ryan says to Tom, you know, have you been smoking? Have you been drinking? Have you done your homework? And Tom, he's a teenager, so he sort of grunts and he picks up a scab on his arm. And, you know, Ryan presses on because he's got to get the information for the forms. He's got to kind of do the risk assessments. And so even this one-to-one -one time is driven by the demands of the system for information. And that what should be and could be a relationship, the start of a kind of trust between two people that would be necessary to make change, isn't. It actually distances Tom even further from Ryan. So we asked everyone in Ella's family, uh, everyone involved, all the workers involved in Ella's family, to come together. And we plotted the interventions around the wall in the uh, offices of the local authority. And we had this chart. Um, that snaked around the walls and it started very slowly and then as the children grew older and partners came and went it was sort of dizzying in its intensity and the professionals involved who were just able to do their little bit within the silos of the systems we have were really shocked when they saw the full picture and there was this moment of breakdown and a kind of real understanding that we had to make change so we asked everyone to stand back and we asked the families if they could help us design a new approach and we said there would be two rules so firstly, the families would lead, that they would decide um, you know, what would help them most on the path to growing capabilities. And secondly, that the team that joined us, we would use technology to invert this switch. So if you joined us, you would spend 20% of your time on administration and 80% on actually doing work. And of course, many people wanted to join us. We've taken this program since other parts of Britain. And it's always the same because you train to work as a public servant or you know, as a social worker, a carer, because you want to take care of people, not because you want to kind of be you know, filling out forms. So I can't tell you the whole story this evening because I haven't got time, but what I can say is that Ella's life changed, as did the life of, lives of many other families who participated. And the thing that I want to emphasize this morning is that the families were drawn into the capability approach because they instinctively knew that this was something different, that nobody was going to kind of do something to them, nobody was going to try and fix them. And I remember one afternoon being in Wigan, and a dad said to me, you know, is this like teaching a man to fish? And I said, well, yeah, you know, it could be, but it could be you want to garden or you want to cook. And literally his face lit up. Like, for the first time, he saw that this was something real, that he could actually make change, and he would have the support there to make change and be in charge of his own destiny. And so then the families act actively tried to shape the approach. So I work very visually. I use design thinking and methods as a core part of the way that I work. 
And I like design because if we work visually, we can use it to kind of share quite complex ideas with lots of people, like the capability approach, which you know, can be quite complex. And so we were able to work in a very accessible way. And the families looked at our capability framework and our measures, and they wanted to make changes. I was quite annoyed, actually. I really didn't want them to fiddle with the measures. But they said, look, you're not focusing enough on our internal worlds. When I feel confident, when I dare, coming from where I come from, to even think that I can make change, that is a massive step forward, and you've got to be able to kind of register that. So we changed our indicators accordingly. Mm -hmm. And it was really clear that even in the most difficult of places, that people did want to grow their capabilities. So um, I'm, I'm almost out of time, but finally I just want to kind of take the last couple of minutes to talk a little bit directly about the capability approach and why I think that in any transformation of our welfare systems, which we do need, it should sit at the heart. And I think there are two reasons. Now, I'm not a specialist, and I'm very excited to be here this evening with Tanya, who is a specialist in this area. But the capability approach, which was developed by the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen, doesn't tell you, like the welfare state does, that either you should pull up your socks or, or it will try to fix you. Instead, it asks this deceptively simple question, which is, what can we really be or do? And what we can really be or do takes into account the external structural realities of our lives. It's you know, not enough to say, as we often do, that there are opportunities. We have to ask who really has access to those opportunities. So Stan, who lives so close to kind of all the flourishing culture of London, doesn't have access because he can't get out and about on his own to, to make the most of it. And Ella actually lives you know, very close to a kind of much vaunted Honda car factory. But when we met her, she wouldn't have a hope of getting through an interview in that factory. We can't really say, even though there are jobs going, that there's an opportunity for Ella. What we can be or do depends on our external realities, and it depends on our inner worlds, our beliefs, our self-confidence, what we're told we can do or be in subtle ways. Like Florence, who came to believe that she was housebound. These inner beliefs are really powerful. So I think the capability approach is transformative because unlike, say, campaigns for universal basic income, <coughs> external, or all the kind of well-being and happiness agenda, only internal and subjective, it understands that any strategy for change has to bring together the way the external and internal in our world, the structural and the way we feel, interacts on each other, and it has to work from both ends. So this framing is one of the reasons that I think we have to have the capability approach at the heart of 21st century welfare. And the second reason I like it is because it addresses power head on. So Martha Nussbaum, who's the philosopher who's done a lot to develop this approach, talks about, um, she talks about the capability approach as a counter theory because what she says is that most social policy is developed by elites. It's one of the reasons that it fails when it hits the ground. But the capability approach doesn't tell you what's important from the perspective of a program or an institution. And it, as I said, it doesn't try to fix you. It starts instead with this question, what can you be or do? What matters to you? So when we tried this with Anne, who was living you know, in real pain with all these complex conditions and living this life governed by illness, she said that what she would really like to do was to take up her cross-stitch again. So Amy, who worked within our alternative service, said, well, yes, that's a great idea, and she encouraged her to take that first tiny step. So these methods might look unorthodox, they might even look insignificant, but the metrics that followed from that first small step convinced the clinicians later that this was a different approach. So the capability approach starts with your concerns, that's power shift number one, and the second power shift that it can't be done to you. So Anne can say that she wants to take up her cross stitch, but she has to actually do it with the support from Amy. And that's why the families engage, because, of course, they've been the subject of numerous plans that have made about them, and they have to turn up to meetings where you know, everything is discussed in front of them, lots of risk assessments. But now they're the ones that are making the plans, and those plans matter to them. We don't say to them, look, you've got to find work, you've got to get your children into school, because what we believed was if we allow families to grow their capabilities, <coughs> they of their own accord will know those things are important, and they will take action, which is exactly what happened. So what capabilities matter? Martha Nussbaum famously has a list of about 20, which include playing the piano. And, um, you know, actually, I've taken up the piano since I started this work. But in the real work I do, I have to be more pragmatic um, because I think that we can only focus on a few things. And also, I want to measure the impact of the work, and we don't have the source to kind of measure lots of things. So we chose uh, four capabilities, work and learning, which was around, you know, real work and the ability to learn. I don't mean by this getting exams. I mean, be, you know, having the op opportunity to inquire, to keep learning through your life. Health and vitality, so living the best life you can at the stage of life you're at, internally and externally. Being part of a community locally and nationally and globally, and growing relationships. 
And uh, in the evaluations of our work, we could see the impact of these. We measured in lots of different ways, which again I can talk about later, but I haven't really got time to go into now. But the most interesting thing was that as we continued measuring, what we saw was that the relational capability mattered the most. I think it's what Martha Nussbaum calls fertile or architectonic. In other words, it sort of pins up all the others. And it was relationships that enabled those out of work to find work or if they had a crap job to progress to something else. It was relationships that enabled Anne, once she'd made that first change, to sustain the changes and carry on changing. In Circle, it was the relationships that over time started to edge out or offer practical support because people began to do things for one another. And in Ella's case, it was the relationships, first of all with the team and later in the wider community that made the difference. Like the other families we work with, she'd been revolving in the system for 30 years. And when change came, it was the same workers in our team that had always been there, and it was the same families with the same complex problems. But because the relationships between them had changed, because there was actually a real relationship of trust there, things started to happen and change happened. So I think Beveridge, he was a revolutionary, and he did not think that the poor law of the 19th century was suitable for the 20th century. And I want to say that as fantastic as the Beveridge welfare state was, it's not suitable for our 21st century. We've seen that Beveridge himself already had his own concerns. So I think that what we should do is go back to the original vision, one which combined thorough thinking about what was needed to ensure that every single citizen would flourish, and then we should reinvent it for our time and for our economic transformation, the one we're going through now. And in this century, I think that our vision and our new social contract must be rooted in capability, and for me, that is radical help. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Hilary. An uh, absolutely inspiring um, take on, on where we should go from, from here. The, there's so much I, I like about um, what you've said and, and, and what's in the book that it's very hard to know um, what to highlight. Um, and one of the things in particular, I think, is the way that the book has been written on the back of practice and having reflected on what the experience of working in these different contexts has shown you, rather than the other way around, because very often we read blueprints, proposals, new, new suggestions about how services could be reformed, for example, um, that come from a theoretical perspective but haven't been tested in the real world. And the, the process here seems to have been to be um, quite the opposite way around, and that's, that's extremely refreshing. Another thing I particularly like about both your talk and, and the book is the way that you situate professionals as allies rather than part of the problem that needs to be fixed. So the professionals, in your way of positioning them, have the good intentions but are being frustrated by the systems they find themselves in and actually prevented from, from doing the good work that they want to do. And I, I think, again, um, that's a very helpful approach and that sets it apart from the kind of demonisation, say, of nurses and, th and their... Um, callous disregard for patient well-being and so on that we've heard a lot about um, in, in discussions of the NHS recently. And then a third thing that I particularly wanted to, to flag um, that I uh, liked about the analysis was the acknowledgement that all of us need help at some point or another and that we're, we're all moving through uh, different stages in our lives from childhood through to difficult, potentially difficult transitions from uh, youth into adulthood, in and out of work, particularly in more um, insecure labour market that we now find ourselves within, through into the challenges of old age and particularly older old age. And that rather than seeing it as an us and them situation mm -hmm. in terms of um, the provision of uh, and meeting needs, it is, it is about all of us now and then rather than us and them. Um, and I think that analysis is has, um, very welcome in, in this approach and, and has been indeed supported by other analysis, like in, in John Hill's book, Good Times, Bad mm -hmm. Times, mm -hmm. Welfare, Myth, Them and Us, which is, is very much um, yeah. along the same lines, I think. Um, and then, then finally, just in terms of things to, to, to really highlight that I particularly like about the approach is the observation that services compartmentalise problems, but that the solutions need to join up across yeah. services yeah. and that an individual doesn't experience life as being separately about their 
um, diabetes and their uh, loneliness and their um, lack of ability to get a job, those are all just part of life and that seeing these things as connected rather than compartmentalised across our traditional service boundaries is, is critical to, to getting a, a, good, a good solution. So you, you particularly highlighted in, in your talk the role of the capability approach, yeah. which, as you, as you said, um, is something that I've um, been very interested in over, over a number of years. Um, and specifically, the, the four capabilities yeah. that you um, found helpful to work with in, in conversation with your families and others that you're working with. So the, the work and learning, health, community and relationships, all of which I think are um, clearly profoundly important. In, in the work that I've done, we've tended to work with a longer list. You mentioned Martha Nussbaum's 20. The Equality and Human Rights Commission um, has got a measurement framework, the, the latest version, which has six um, categories, and, and there are other frameworks around that, that um, have varying ranges of, of capabilities. Most, I think, can uh, one can see how they fit into those four that you've highlighted. Um, but one I'd be very interested to, to maybe ask you a little about sort of how you would see it fitting in, whether it does, whether it came up in the, in the work that you were doing with the families, um, is around personal and legal security, uh, which I guess has two aspects to it. One is about um, being free from the fear of violence and free from the experience of violence from others, whether that's um, in the domestic setting or, or elsewhere. Uh, but also knowing that your rights will be respected, so freedom from discrimination and um, being treated um, with dignity by um, institutions and professionals that you engage with. And indeed, sometimes defending your rights against the state. For example, um, if you're a young Muslim man in London, your chances of um, being stopped by the police are many times higher than if you're um, from a white ethnic background. So sometimes the capabilities that we need are capabilities against the state rather than well, even if you're a family, the actually, because you know middle class families not going to get their child taken into care. I mean, the, the yes. social demographics are just incredible. So yes, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so, but anyway, yes. <laughs> so I'd be interested to see how yes. sort of how that features within those four capabilities yes. or, or separately. Um, and then the, the second aspect of capability, I think it might just be interesting to to discuss a little more is. Um, what you were touching on in relation to the relationship between um, what we might think of the agency and structure. Mm -hmm. so, so individuals um, being able to identify which capabilities they want to grow and maybe some steps as to how they want to grow them, but needing help, um, the support, the kind of horizontal relationships you've particularly emphasised in order to change the constraints um, that have operated on them thus far and that, that, that the capability approach draws our attention to that interaction between <laughs> agency and structure. But the kind of bottom-up um, approach you describe, which is clearly very powerful, seems to me to be most likely to focus our attention on the constraints that are nearest mm -hmm. to people, mm -hmm. the things that immediately surround them, um, such as um, the fact that they've got steps outside their house rather than a ramp and that that means mm -hmm. that they can't get out. And then we can change that and they can get out around the house, around the, the local park, say. Um, but of course, many of the things that structure the people's capabilities are at a far yes. more abstract and macro level than that, mm -hmm. such as um, wealth inequality overall, so who, who gets to hold yes. the goods in the first place, um, the structure of the labour market, the distribution of different types of work um, that are available, and what, what Stiglitz calls the rules of the game, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. In, including, including the legal yeah. structures within which people work. And I wonder to what extent you feel that the approach that you're advocating here um, can reach those macro mm -hmm. structures, or to what extent we may need parallel complementary strategies to the ones that you're advocating here that would focus more on those kind of macro level constraints. Mm -hmm. Well, they're really good questions. And I have to say that... Um, you know, when I picked the four capabilities, I just, I just think, actually I wanted three, we had to add health, because I think people can't keep more than three things in their mind. I can't, it's probably just because I'm so simple. But, um, so I, I put this framework together and I was always waiting for somebody to come along and go, but no, that won't work, you've got to put this capability in, and nobody did, so I thought, oh, well, I've, I've got to work with it. So this is the first time that I have the, you know, the kind of great conversation of you saying, and I think the six categories actually didn't exist when I did the work. Mm, I no. think six would be kind of much, much better. So, um, 
And of course, for me, the most ideal would be, you know, if we're, if we're kind of really beginning to plot, is that, OK, we'll kind of design a welfare state around capability. We'll be advising the prime minister. So we'll have the kind of macro idea of the greater capabilities. And then, you know, that also goes to your second question, that one begins to interact with the other. But to go specifically to your... Um, you know, I think that the thing of the fear of violence and rights, it would have been really interesting to have that capability in there. And I think particularly... Uh, to be able to have that discussion with the families we work with would have been very powerful because, as I say, you know, there is this fear that uh, mm. your child is going to be taken mm. away. But also, all the families we work with experience very high levels of domestic abuse. And um, often, some of the kind of most important work that would happen would be uh, somebody in the family able to close their door, decide who is coming in and out, you know, say no to the partner. And to the outside world, to the kind of services, that could look like, oh my goodness, you know, some, some boundary has gone up, that this is going backwards, and they could get mm. kind of very nervous about mm. it. But actually, of course, it was a step forward. It would have been really interesting mm. if we'd had that kind of capability and we'd been able to kind of articulate it in that way, which, which we, didn't, we didn't have. I mean, I think also the other thing to say is that um, in the work that we were doing, we were already seen as pretty out there. So I think if we, you know, the idea was that we'd given even more kind of, you know, sort of, you know, to young people to talk about, like, look, these are my rights, that would have been. But I think it would have been really interesting. And then the second question you ask about agency and structure and kind of individualistic, I think it's really important. So I think that one of the most uh, powerful things I have learned and, and upsetting things for me over the last 10 years has been that the extent to which people internalise the rhetoric of the state. So uh, when we stuck up a, a, you know, a door in a job centre that said, get me out of here, people came through because they were convinced that everybody else there was a striver or a shirker and that they, wanted, they were not and they wanted to get away from it. When we tried to work with young people and say to them, look, stop you know, delivering this dog-eared CV to everybody because it's never going to get you a job. Like, join us. And, and you know, pe they, they were re it was really hard work because young people really thought if they kept delivering their CV that they would get some job, which, of course, is completely not how the world works. I'm sorry if you're young and hear me being... <laughs> you can, we, I'll talk to you afterwards about how it works. So I think that, you know, I think that, that this, is, this is really important and that all we could do in our work was begin to kind of, on the one hand, unpick that at quite a personal level, as you're saying, and also to begin to kind of... Uh, to, to situate the work in a different way, to say, look, you know, um, we've got to stop talking about individual families. We've got a capitalist system in which there are winners and losers. You've got to see this as part of kind of a bigger shift, not as an individual problem. It's the same with work. You know, the way DWP sees work is this kind of obsession with the individual job hunt and slotting that person into a job, rather than thinking, you know, as you were saying, you know, look, these shifts, they're huge, they're deep, they're fast, they're affecting all of us. We can't navigate these tides alone. So it would be much better to say, look, we're all in this together. What on earth are we going to, to do about it? So I think at that level, we were able to talk about it. And I think, you know, particularly with the work, um, I've got a chapter on young people in the book. And, um, I mean, they very, very powerfully realised that the rules of the game were stacked against them. Mm -hmm. And most of the conversations were with young people who were just angry at being fobbed off and knowing in all sorts of ways, you know, about how those rules needed to cha change, and also themselves perceiving that that rule was about relationships. It was about who they knew and what they were locked out of, and they were in this sort of bog-standard system that basically wasn't going to get them anywhere. And uh, when we tried, you know, in fact, that was kind of the biggest failure, if you read about it in the book. It was just considered so risky when we tried to disrupt that, and what mm -hmm. happened is, is, is in the book. But I think that that's, that's really important. So of course, one of the things we've talked about... Um, before is that some people don't like the capability approach because they consider it to be too economistic and too individualistic and about the individual's capabilities. Um, but we did kind of frame it as relational and we mm. did frame it across, across a community. And it, I would have, you know, what I would have ideally liked to do would be to kind of begin to kind of work much more broadly at the community level and develop those capabilities. But what I felt was that if we want to turn the system on its head, the capability uh, framework has got, you know, your work, the work of many others, like real rigour. It's, you know, it's, it's something that is stable that we can really mm. begin to use that, to challenge these sort of really unsuitable systems mm. of kind of managing need. Mm. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I could continue discussing with Hilary <laughs> for many more hours, but I should give you a chance to come in. So if you'd just like to indicate we've got a roving mic on, on either side. Right at the back in the middle. Please. Can you say who you are? It would be great <laughs> for me to know who everybody is. 
I'm, I'm uh, David from Local Trust. We run the Big Local Experiment, which is 150 neighbourhoods given a million pounds each to spend as they see fit. I think a lot of people involved in the programme would really chime with um, some of the themes that you've, you've drawn out, um, mostly relationships. So uh, m most of the people in involved spend a huge, sort of nice percent of their time just building relationships with those in the community, and then about 10% actually doing projects, um, which is the stuff that, that sort of gets into to local news and we get to talk about a success, but the relationships are really the key. Um, it also reveals a bit of a problem, though, which is that in some uh, neighbourhoods, uh, partly to do with changes in tenure, so moving to private renting, uh, they're really transient communities. Um, and I think those uh, people trying to work on this kind of relational welfare project found it almost impossible to uh, find a way of, of working with someone that's going to uh, move house in kind of six months because they get evicted. Um, so I wonder what you made of, of that problem. Uh, if you'd seen any examples, either in the UK or around the world, of um, uh, a way in which relational welfare can work with, with a population that, that moves around quite a lot. Shall, shall I answer? I mean, I think there's a lot. I mean, that's a real, it's a challenge. It's a good question because it's a real challenge, and I can't say that I've got the answer. But I think that, um, I think, you know, for instance, one of the things we did with our families is they were constantly evicted. So part of the, the contract, really, with the local authority of working in that place was that that was going to stop and that we were going to, in fact, that was one of the biggest places we saved money, was that, you know, we're, that everybody has to stand back. We're not going to be evicting these families. They're going to be here now. So actually working with that structure. Of course, it's different if people are kind of in private rented accommodation and they're, and they're moving around. Um, and I think that um, one... One thing I talk about in the book that I think is very interesting is the way that in Leeds they've invested, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but they've invested in their communities in the way it sounds like you're doing, but on 10-year horizons with really significant sums of money. So that has completely changed the rules of the game because instead of thinking like, well, we're lucky, you know, we lived in this place where we don't really want to be, but like we've got a bit now, but what's happening next? Those communities, and people defined themselves. So Leeds divided itself, I think, 20 years ago into these communities and some are kind of three streets, some are kind of huge areas. But knowing that that funding is there and that they're going to be able to work in that different way, I think has done quite a bit to kind of ameliorate some of those problems. But it's a huge challenge. I mean, you can think if you had a capability framework as well that you would be able to kind of passport it in some way and that, you know, that you could begin to kind of move things around with you. But it, it's a challenge. Yeah, in the middle here. Hi, I'm Sean Cantor. I'm an economist at Florida State University in the United States. So um, this is going to be a very American-centric question, but you know we face some of the problems that, that you identified is that our social insurance systems are now captured by the bureaucracy. And so the ideas that you present, which I'm really happy to hear because I, I like to be, feel optimistic for a moment, you know, I, I'm really worried about how it gets implemented in practice. How, how does it get scaled up to a, a state level or a national level? Because at least for the last 50 years in the United States, the government programs that have increased so dramatically have crowded out kind of the private solutions, the private organizations and institutions we had beforehand. There's nothing left anymore, essentially. And so, so how, how do we undo the mess that we've created in the United States? I, I can't speak about England. I mean, I don't think I can really pontificate about the United <laughs> States either. I mean, but, but I mean, I think, well, one really, in fact, one really interesting thing is that I've been kind of supporting a PhD student who's been doing her PhD on our family program and comparing it with a family program in the U.S. that is run in very similar lines. In fact, in the U.S. program, if the team intervene with the family, they get fired. I mean, there's they, they're, they're, idea that the family lead is so strong that you know that you are not allowed to do this in the team and it's been really I mean I've only learned about this vicariously through the PhD student but what really interests me is that this kind of same work outside of a state structure has been able in some ways to kind of really flourish in a way that was always much more mediated because we could have our kind of you know ideas and then we're kind of in the reality working with you know, I was working with very different local authorities, urban, rural, left-wing, right-wing, so, you know, there was always that mediation. But in the book, there is a story of one uh, local authority who uh, started actually with the family program. Uh, when huge, the huge cuts came in 2009, they lost 20% of their budget, 
and they used the experience and the capability approach to basically re-engineer all the services in their authority. So in fact, what they did, they did have to make big cuts, but what they did was they, um, they re-interviewed everybody in that authority according to uh, the life program values, which actually was an early version of the, that was our fund, an early version of the capabilities. So if you were the accountant or the HR person or whatever, you basically had to become part of that culture or you were one of the people that lost their jobs. And so it's quite interesting they're at the very early beginning now of kind of, of, of putting that through the whole system. But what I would say, I don't find it, I find it really interesting. I don't find it frightening because also part of that deal, they call it the deal actually, is that they have invested, they have passed over significant sums to the community. So they really didn't want it to be uh, seen as something that would be like, you know, well, we're just doing this because we've got less resources so we're going to kind of close it in this language. They have kind of really empowered their communities. I think the thing is that there's so much more resource than we think, but we have to, you know, it's what I'm saying, we have to be there on the ground to find it. From up high, it doesn't look great. Everybody's gone a bit like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Question down here at the front, please. Just down here. Yeah. Oh, cheers, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thanks so much for the lecture. Um, my name's Shomo from Best Beginnings, uh, Peronese Charity. Um, and uh, sort of worked around community development for about 10 years. In that time, um, especially before, I think, there was a, a lot of talk about sort of uh, SEN and capability approaches, um, and especially amongst community organizations. But what I've found is that there's a big gap, I think, well, you've touched on it quite a lot, actually, between policy making and community level organizations. Uh, and um, uh, I sort of not want to really get involved at that level. Um, so what do you see as like the biggest barrier to actually getting policymakers to think in the ways that actually hundreds of community organizations around the country are trying so hard to work? I think it's really interesting. I mean, one of the things, we measured our work in three ways. We measured, we'll be saving money, we kind of ranked ourselves against traditional indicators of services, and then we developed this measurement of the capability approach. And, and Daniel can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's probably fair to say that nobody was interested in our capability. Was anybody ever interested in our capability measures? Maybe, a bit, but not really, you know, not really. Like, if we'd saved money, that was great. If we kind of had outperformed their whatever their traditional outcome indicators were, that really mattered. The capability indicators were mission critical for us because they kept, you know, as we kind of did scale the work, they kept teams kind of focused on the same culture. They kind of showed us we learned from them. So I suppose... One of the things, I mean, I talk about this in the book, I do think that's what, I do think that change comes through lots of small steps from small organizations. But I think that only happens if you're part of a bigger vision. It doesn't happen if you're all working all over the place in a kind of very disparate way. So if, I mean, I haven't actually come across people working with the capability approach. I think it's brilliant that they are. And I would say that that would be really powerful because if you are all able to share a language and you can show that your work adds up to something greater, that begins a very different conversation. Whereas at the moment you're, you're doing amazing work but you're kind of subject to the winds of whatever latest government policy is going to blow through and that is very hard. I think there was a gentleman here. Any? Yeah. This lady in the second row here. That was really good, sorry. My name is Una Murphy, and um, I'm a coach and facilitator, so I really believe in empowering people, so that's where I come from in this conversation. Um, that's why I'm here. Um, you said something really interesting about the external and the internal and the interaction between the two and the importance of people's mindset shift that you're working with, and it sounds to me like you're really struggling with getting the mindset shift with the policymakers. And I'm just curious about how you can, because it's tragic that you're saying that the people at the top who at the moment have the power are looking at your metrics only in terms of, in terms of their own, uh, you know, saving money or the change it makes in terms of their traditional structures, but not even interested in your capability model. What, what is it we need to do to get them to think, change their mindset? Have you any thoughts on that? I, I mean, I'm not saying that they're not intellectually, emotionally interested, but all I'm saying is that pragmatically, like you're saying, you know, it's like the same thing of good people can't work in bad systems, that basically, you know, and rightly so, like if you're the local authority chief exec, to keep your budget for your citizens, you've got to keep focused on this. You can't say right now, like, I love these capabilities. You know, nothing, nothing is going to flow from them. 
But look, I want to kind of turn that around. The reason that I wrote a book and a kind of public-facing book is that I think what needs to change is the public debate needs to change. Because my experience is that we do have great leaders, not all of them, but it's very, very difficult for them to make change because the debate is is so stuck in this, as I say, as we saw today, like, are we going to put more money in or are we not? And are we going to reorganise or are we not? We're having no conversation whatsoever, really, about, uh, you know, what, what could be the alternatives. And, and therefore, I mean, in the same as your question goes to, really, and therefore kind of building this, this conversation, which was absolutely critical to beverage. I mean, civil servants did try to stop beverage, but beverage had mass public support. He was seen as the people's William, and in the end, you know, people thought we've got to do this because it's got mass public support. So I'm not, I'm not saying that it, that, that mindset set shift doesn't need to change. I, I think that it's there. I think loads. You know, we had this very small manifesto, and people came and found us. But the co the problem is that the conversation is not bigger. And so that's why, like, I really hope in my tiny way, writing this book and sharing it, that that will be just you know one little pebble in the pond of kind of making the ripple ripple bigger and and starting that that conversation, really. If we go to the gentleman just behind this last contributor, in the blue shirt. Cheers. Oh, hello. I'm, my name's Paul. I work uh, currently as a live-in volunteer with a community that um, uh, houses refugees and, um, and provides for rough sleepers uh, in, down in Cla uh, Clapton. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious as to um, if you discovered that there's a, a definite intergenerational pattern that um, occurs. Um, because, I mean, your, the title of your book is Radical Help, but I, I don't really see that it's really going to um, create a new, a new um, paradigm, shall we say. Um, it's just not radical enough. Um, and I think so. I suppose some of the solutions, which, which would be, well, um, on the, shall we say, on the conservative side, you know, people. When I t when I speak to people, they they say, you know, people from a different background to those living in uh, Peckham, shall we say, they they can't understand why there's such a breakdown, because they're coming from families and communities and extended networks and parishes and. You know, you know, you know how middle class ethos works. You you help out your own, so and so they're they're detached from everything you've seen. So how would you answer someone saying, um, "This is that your your solution, shall we say, or your proposals are not going to in any way alter the duplication, the replication from one generation to the next." actually don't agree. I think that we, we, we absolutely saw the break of that. So for instance with the families, we were working with families where the parents had been abused and that was happening with the children. Mm -hmm. And that the intervention we made stopped, not in every case, we can't cure everything, but absolutely stopped that cycle. It's the same with the work, thinking about work differently. You can be in a family that is, you know, in always in kind of low paid work. Uh, you just kind of continually cycle in and out of low-paid work. You only know other people that do that. And in creating a kind of different community which had people in work, out of work from different... We began to kind of rupture that. So I, I disagree, actually. I think that um, in a small way, remember that I'm really still talking about small work, it was very powerful in rupturing that. Now, if, if I was kind of waving a magic wand, would I kind of do more? I probably would. And I guess, you know, that that's... It sort of goes to Una's question as well. It's about sort of trying to judge where, you know, pragmatically the welfare state happened because it was supported on left and right by young and old. Like, we have to find a story that is baggy enough that enough of us can get into. So maybe, I mean, you know, I, what you say you do is just incredible work. So obviously you're a very amazing human being. And, you know, maybe you will always find that kind of baggy story. You'll be on the more radical end of it. But I think we have to kind of try and find a story that includes as many people as possible. I think what they do is they point to schools which are failing. And they, 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 they become a catalyst. And they get a new headmaster and give them autonomy. It gets new staff in. And within two or three years, it seems like people are going off to Oxford. Whereas, you know, prior to that, there 
there's just no aspiration at all. So what we're saying, look, it can, if you can do it with school, do it, extend that out to other, you know, the, the benefit system. So I think there's a question. Yep, someone took a minute ago there. Uh, thank you, sort Hillary. I think you've, uh, my name is Josh. Um, I think you made a really powerful normative case and condensed your book well <laughs> um, for for the uh, capability approach. Uh, my question is, and you touched on the theme of loneliness in your talk, but you didn't focus on it. Um, you you don't have to be poor to be lonely, and you don't have to be old to be lonely. Um, and the capability approach would seem to serve the poor and the old who are lonely well. Um, how would the capability approach capture those who don't fall into the, the old or the poor bracket who happen to feel lonely? Because as you know, loneliness is a m massive problem in Britain right now. So how, how, would, how would your approach uh, capture and solve that problem? Although we did have a kind of intervention around loneliness, and although Circle, the ageing project, definitely did kind of have a, a very measurable impact on that, um, you know, the approach was to kind of knit people together, different people together horizontally, and not to say, like, who's lonely, because after all, most people are never going to confess that they're, they're lonely. But I think what was really important and does go to the kind of challenge with policymaking is that, is that everything we did included everybody. So if we've got a youth service, we want everybody in. We want, you know, thriving young people, young people who are struggling. You know, if we've got an unemployment service, so-called, we didn't call it that, we want everybody in, people who are in good work, people who are looking for good work, and this was the way that we built. Now, that's really countercultural. People would come to, you know, the office and they'd pick up a photo and go, oh, this person here looks very middle class. What were they, what were they doing on that, that trip or in that, you know? So I think that this... To, you know, that what we were trying to say was, look, if the most important resource we have is relationships, to your point that that, wherever you are in life, that erodes loneliness, then it's really important to build new universal services that include everybody, because in that way we'll begin to kind of, you know, encroach on the kind of bigger uh, problem of sort of anomie that you're kind of, you're talking about. But those things go into the other capabilities as well, don't they? I mean, you know, what kind of work you've got, whether you feel cut off, what kind of school you're in, what kind of learning, you know, right across the piece, basically. And, you know, Beveridge also worried about loneliness. I mean, it's not actually completely a new problem. Well, audiences, I would guess about 60%, 70% female, but almost all our contributors thus far have been male. So <laughs> I just encourage the female members of the audience to speak up. Hooray! In the uh, row there. Um, hi, I'm Ankita. I am a writer and I just graduated from uni. And I had a question actually about women. And you mentioned that when this, when Beveridge created the welfare state, we had these women who were working at ho from home and, you know, looking after their children. How, in your approach, would childcare shift? And yeah, what's your model for a new way of looking after our children? Thanks. So, yes, I mean, it wasn't just that women were at home, it was like absolutely assumed that they would do the kind of unpaid labour. And I only touch on childcare quite briefly, actually. And, I, um, and the thing is that I really want to kind of reposition childcare in a kind of relational framework, because I feel at the moment if you want to be at home looking after your very young children, that is somehow considered to be like something we shouldn't do anymore, which I think is problematic. I think, you know, women do often want to be with their very young children. Um, on the other hand, if you, you know, and it's, it's seen entirely as economic, isn't it? It's like now that the, the thing is flipped. So like, you know, everybody must be out to work because otherwise, you know, you're not a good citizen. You're not kind of earning and contributing to your taxes. So I would like to have a kind of much broader discussion about kind of how relationships fit into our lives at different stages. And I would like to kind of reposition 
and ask some questions around kind of childcare that are also relational because what's happened is that to try and provide good childcare, we've again gone back to the kind of mechanics of the system. You know, we now are allowed to leave six small children with a carer because they're well trained, but anybody here who's got small children knows that if you can't do anything creative with six small children, you can't even take six tiny children on a walk, you know. So, so I think that, you know, if we, it, all of these problems, if we begin to think and ask the questions from a relational perspective, we begin to kind of see some very different things that might be possible. And again, I'm very interested, and there are some really good examples of this, of very informal organisations that come together again, that people kind of ch share things in different ways that are, you know, first of all, you see the problem in a relational framework, and then you kind of have a relational way of, of, of solving it. But a lot of these things at the moment run up against kind of risk frameworks of like, you know, how many loons you have and these kind of, so it's quite a complex area. It's really an important one. Thank you for raising it. Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Jennifer West. I'm also from the United States, and I'm a child advocate. I work with neglected and abused children who are in the child, the, the family dependency system, court system back home. And you mentioned the problem with so much relying on paperwork and that social workers are spending 70% of their time doing paperwork. And I'm not a social worker, but I work with social workers who are indeed spending that much time. And the product of their time, I'm finding, is very shoddy paperwork, but yet these are documents that are in the legal system, so everything needs to be accounted for, everything needs to be documented. Did you do anything so radical as cut the paperwork and, and be, l enable these people to spend more time with the children or families that they're working with, and what was the result of less paperwork? So uh, it's a really interesting question because the problem is global. I'm working in Norway as well at the moment on exactly the same challenge. So it's like Britain, America, Norway, it's, it's the same everywhere. And as you say, like the paperwork is not, is not great, but it, it's like it's feeding the system, isn't it? So yes, we did. We were able to, we did, when we put teams together, we did offer them 80% of their time. So we did flip it. We, we took out the administration and we enabled 80% of time working with the families. Now what's really incredible, and in fact what really flipped things around in the first place that we worked, was that uh, quite early on, a family came forward where there was terrible abuse and they were not on the radar of anybody. And then the social workers who were kind of in the child protection service and everything really were, I mean, by their own admission, really taken aback because they were like, okay, we could see then that actually all this time spent in paperwork, we're not seeing stuff, we don't have the relationships of trust where families can come forward. And actually in every location we've worked, we've seen this where flipping it around, enabling um, <coughs> this, this split, as I say, to actually work with families we're able to reunite children with their families, but also we do see families come forward that nobody saw on the radar and the children come forward. They think they feel safe enough to come forward and say, this is happening to me. So it's really profound. Mm -hmm. And part of that perhaps is a lack of trust on the part of the system in the professionals. So, I mean, part of what generates the paperwork is documenting that you're oh, doing your totally. job properly. I mean, it's horrific. And, you know, like a third of social work positions are empty in the UK because exactly that. How can you train to be a social worker with all those skills and all that instinct? And, and I do think, and I really liked actually that you picked that up. I mean, I do really want to say that this is about taking care of everyone. You know, it's... Mm. it's we don't even trust teachers to mark exams anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's like, what is this? It, it's crazy. Yeah. Other thoughts? I think we can allow the, the, the men folk to come back in now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, didn't mean to shut you up. Well, we can give me a risk. People to can talk amongst themselves. <laughs> <laughs> encourage <laughs> other contributions, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Anjali. I work in monitoring and evaluation for a charity called Sustrans, um, doing sustainable transport and sustainable urban design stuff. Um, I was wondering to what extent have you explored preventative applications of the capability framework rather than sort of reactive um, to social problems that you've observed? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's a really hard question to answer because, because we don't see it as reactive or preventive. It doesn't work like that because we're not ever asking people what their needs are. In fact, one of the greatest problems of our work was that we couldn't really do baselines because we're not interested in that. We're interested in meeting you where you are, whether you're, you know, whether you're thriving. Like, not everybody in our, in our 
services or whatever they are has got problems. They might be there because they're helping somebody else, because they're enjoying what we're doing. So we didn't really have that distinction at all, actually. So de facto, it's preventative. Yeah. And Sophie, in terms of preventing exclusion before it happens or preventing sort of, yeah, in terms of a loneliness issue or... Well, so one of the things which is complicated compared to the question that Josh asked earlier is that one of the things we did do because we were very uh, conscious of how cultures get set early on is that we would start community work in places that were more uh, deprived, let's <coughs> say. You know, if we're going to kind of go and work in the London borough, we'll start it in the place that is more deprived than the wealth, because you know, everywhere in London is a patchwork. So to make sure that we're kind of rooted in that from the beginning, that's the, that's the thing. But you know, these, these networks have to be constantly facilitated to make sure that you're reaching out, that you're, you're always working on that, and kind of very, very alive to it. But the idea is with relationships, everybody in, everybody has something to bring. It's not whether you've got a problem or not or whether something needs to be prevented. Further along the same row. Hi, my name is Natalia. I'm a service science student and a master in at BRCA. And you talked a lot about trust and how the relational approach could create a real relationship of trust. And thinking about public services in this legitimate crisis ongoing everywhere in the world, how we can enable these approaches from public services. It's a really big question. I need to write another book. I think it's a really good question. I mean, the thing is, is that I think the first thing that really matters is this is just a small thing because I could say so much, but one of the things I think really, really matters is how you meet people. You know, by which I mean, how does that first interaction begin? So like in the family program, for instance, that first interaction began with an invitation. Would you like to participate? So these are families that are being commanded because like, you know, this is the end of the scale where, you know, everybody's around and they're being documented in the way we've been talked about. So immediately, that says something very different. Hang on a minute, who are these people? They've sent me an invitation. They're not telling me I have to show up. They, they're like asking me. And uh, it was quite hard. You know, people were very, very worried in the beginning that if you do that, are you really gonna get the toughest cases? And we did, because over time, the kind of word went out. But another example that I think <coughs> is really important of this is that, um, is how we use our time. So what happens in public services is that all the focus is in that first meeting, whether it's the doctor, the unemployment advisor, whatever it is, it's like, boom. Like, you know, we've got to get all this information, we've got to tell you everything, and then we hope you turn up again, and most people don't turn up again. But, you know, that isn't how life is, is it? If we afterwards have a nice chat together, we're going to kind of talk a bit about what we both do, and then later we'll talk about our families. And so it's exactly the same when you kind of want to support people or kind of bring people in. You have to kind of start like a first date. You can't, you know, until everybody feels comfortable. You can't kind of go boom into starting to talk to people about things that are maybe shameful, like loneliness or kind of needs, because everybody's feeling rather anxious. So I think it's about thinking, and you're a designer. So I mean, I think design is so important to this. You can provide different roles, different props, different contexts, which really help to kind of shift. And a lot of the work that I do with design is, um, giving existing professionals different props so that they kind of, you know, even so that you, you've got a bit of courage. It's like putting your big toe in the water. Like if I've been forced to work in this way for so long, will it really work if I work in that way? Okay, well, I've got this prop now and I can kind of feel brave enough to do it. So your work's important. On this row. Um, so Are you all designers? This is the well, yeah, design yeah, row. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm India, and I'm doing my dissertation on the welfare state. Um, I was just really interested. How would you define the welfare state? Because it feels a bit of a slippery fish. Feels like it depends on who's defining it and who you are. And also, would that definition change in the future if the capabilities approach was more prevalent? And how would it change? So this is a brilliant question. So first of all. I would like never to use the term welfare state again. I would have liked to have kind of come through this whole writing process with the idea of what it's going to be called, but I'm it took me longer to get a title for my PhD than it took to write it. So, <laughs> like, you know, and without my wonderful editor who's here this evening, I wouldn't have had a title at all, and we had to put welfare state in. But I think we would, you know, it would be brilliant to say, okay, it's now called the social capability, whatever. Do you know what I mean? But we couldn't, you know, I couldn't think what that should be. 
Um, so I think it would be radical help is good, you know, but I think it would be good to kind of think about what that would be. Uh, do you know the work of Nick Timmins, who's the biographer of the welfare state? You must read. He's written a book which is a doorstep on the welfare state, but it's so readable that you will love it. It's completely brilliant. And uh, you can read it late at night in bed. It's, it's brilliant. Um, but he says something very interesting. He says that there was a kind of manoeuvre when Tony Blair came into power. And what Tony Blair did was that he said, welfare state bad. Welfare state now is just going to be unemployment benefits, all those, sh you know, sh or whatever, I can't even get the word out over there. <laughs> and then there's going to be public services, that's going to be good, that's going to be what we all, the good people use, education, health, all the good stuff. And he has tracked the use of the word welfare state, and since then, since 1997, 98, I'm not quite sure when this actually came in, um, the government has not published reports with the word welfare state in the title. But before that, there used to be hundreds a year. It's really interesting. So you are right that it's a slippery fish, and also that it's a fish that is politically manipulated and that it's, it would be great to think of something. Tonight I propose radical help, but I'm open to kind of any <laughs> offers. Uh, that, that would be something that people feel they want to be part of that is much more broader and in the way that Tanya was saying begins to kind of knit together lots of issues. Because after all, kind of social housing wasn't really officially part of the welfare state, but we can all see that housing needs to be you know, part of any solution. So one, one term I've noticed being used quite a bit more is social protection, um, which at the moment, again, is still ill-defined and can mean just a more narrow focus on social security and taxation, but I think has the potential to be broadened out into a concept that is not too far away from the idea of capabilities. Um, but it's interesting as well because people talk about contribution, don't they? Now, of course, I love contribution. None of our things would work without massive contribution and everybody contributed. But whenever I hear contribution talked about, it's in a very punitive way of like, oh, these people, they're not contributing, you know. So, and it, it can be the same with, it's like really hard to find words, isn't it, that don't already don't have carry baggage. baggage. Mm. But yes, yeah, that's it's true. interesting. Anybody who hasn't yet contributed, I'll come back to you next, but is there anyone else who would like to make a point who hasn't yet? Come back to you, thank you. I'm just curious if anyone approached you, if you had any interest in doing anything around mental health services. I've had personal experience there that has been pretty horrendous <laughs> um, from people that I care about that have um, needed that support. And I'm just wondering, because it's obviously a huge issue it's something that's increasingly <coughs> talked about they're putting money into it um it's a broken system i think in my opinion um and desperate if you have to encounter it um for everyone and the family involved so i'm just curious if it's something that you've if you'd any contact with it or were you was it one that was too hot to handle <laughs> No, I mean, one of the things is that obviously because what I've tried to do to get out of the kind of strictures of services is sort of talk, you know, like through life stages. So, of course, okay. mental health really crosses that. Yeah. But actually, um, it, I have, uh, whilst I've been writing the book, I've been doing a lot of, one of the main things I've been doing is working in mental health, actually. And I agree with you. And I think it goes back to the thing that we were talking about earlier about public debate, because one of the things as well that most strikes me about mental health, particularly at the kind of acute end, is it's a really good example of how all our frameworks are locked into risk management. Mm -hmm. And so there's just so much energy, professional time in managing risk because we can't accept that anything would happen. But then everybody is in a straitjacket, so no change happens and it's very, very grim. And it's another case of where, you know, like I've been talking about carers for older people, you know, doing lots of ethnographic work I've been doing alongside carers in those systems is, you know, it's horrific that we expect people to take care of other people, you know, under those conditions in paid in that way, really. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Just wait for the mic. Hi, I'm Amy, and I'm an ex-student of Tanya's. Uh, I'm looking forward to starting the Frontline program in a few oh. months. Yeah. So that the talk's been thanks. <laughs> Uh, talk's been really inspiring and it's, I think, will be a really helpful framework to consider. I was just wondering what you're going to do next. Oh, <laughs> good question. Oh, it's great about Frontline. The person who ran our family work actually then went and trained at Frontline. Um, I don't know. I, there's tons of things I want to do. I have to say that one of the things that I am most interested in is work. 
I'm really interested in how kind of like bad work has basically flipped everything into a welfare system. It's like a category mistake. And so everybody is in the welfare system feeling kind of really angry. And actually what we need to do is kind of get back out. I'm very interested in modern unions. You know, what would be something that brings society together in a different way? And, you know, given the real challenges of the kind of industrial transformation we're going through, what, what different kind of things can we build? So that would be... Um, but I'm very interested as well to see, you know, what can come out of the book and whether we can get kind of more energy, a public debate going and more energy behind the kind of ideas in the book. So uh, they're still very live for me, actually. It's, I'm, it's still and, and, really. It seems a good place to end, that we Thank want more, more of the same, please, Hilary, more of, more of the same. Well, come and buy the book, and that will be brilliant. The book is, is uh, just outside. Do, uh, if you've liked what you've heard so far, do, do pick up your copy on the, on the way out. Um, I don't know if you can stay around just for a few minutes, yes, Hilary, if people have got further sign, questions they want yes. to. And thank you all so much, because it's so interesting to kind of hear the questions and, you know, it helps my learning and helps keep thinking about these ideas. So thank you, everybody, who came and asked me a question. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.